Good evening, this is Making the Case. I'm Yuri Chawalde. We take you back out to Brunswick, Georgia tonight as witness testimony resumed in the trial of Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan, all charged with the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, who was shot and killed in February of 2020. BNC's Dre Clark is in Brunswick with the latest. Prosecutors are trying to give jurors a glimpse into the mindset of the three men accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery immediately after the shooting. To do that, they're calling police officers to testify and also showing their body cam footage to jurors where you can hear the men talking about the shooting. Former Glenn County police officer Ricky Menchu was first on the scene the day Ahmad Arbery was shot and killed. Menchu testified that Arbery was still breathing when he first saw him lying in the middle of the street covered in blood. I heard um, it's a, like, a, like an agonal breathing. I've always heard it being called a death rattle. Seeing that, did you attempt any CPR or anything like that on the deceased male? I did not, no, no. Minshew was dispatched to the mostly white neighborhood after someone reported a suspicious black man running wearing a white t-shirt. He said while driving in the area, he heard gunshots. Minutes later, he testified, Gregory and Travis McMichael flagged him down with Arbery, laying only feet away from them. This guy comes hauling ass down the street. I'm talking about in a If you lose at him, you know. The McMichaels and their neighbor, William Bryan, claim they chased Arbery because they believed he was a burglary suspect and they were going to make a citizen's arrest. Bryan recorded the chase on his cell phone as he drove wildly, sometimes on the wrong side of the road, trying to box Arbery in. Did he say specifically that he cornered Ahmad during this chase? Yes, ma'am. Mitchell said Brian told him he didn't know the McMichaels or Arbery, but he picked a side and joined the chase anyway. So having no knowledge of what was going on, he asked the truck whether they had him. That's correct. Okay. Did he ever ask the black guy if he was okay? No, ma'am, he did not say he did. Brian claims he never heard Arbery say anything during the pursuit and that he never threatened any of them. Menchu testified Brian said the only thing he heard was the McMichaels yelling at Arbery, asking, what did you steal? What did you do? The chase ended after Arbery got tired of running for his life. Cell phone video shows him trying to fight back with a gun pointed at his torso. But Travis McMichael fires three gunshots from a 12-gauge, ending Arbery's life and later telling police it was self-defense. William Bryan's attorney, Kevin Goff, pushed back during cross-examination, asking Minshew if Bryan told him that Ahmad Armory tried to force his way into his pickup truck during the chase. Also, Goff referenced a palm print on Bryan's vehicle. But prosecutors say Arbery's palm print is on the vehicle because Bryan tried to cut him off, and Arbery pushed off the vehicle to run away. In Brunswick, Georgia, I'm Dre Clark for Making the Case. Tonight, we get reaction to day two of testimony from veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson, and criminal defense attorney, Molly Palmer. Great having you both. Let's get right to it. Um, all right, starting with the second witness, the state called to the stand today, Ricky Minshew, a former officer with the Glenn County Police Department and the first officer on scene. Let's watch part of Assistant District Attorney Larissa Olivier's direct examination. Did you hear any kind of sounds at all coming from the deceased male? Yes, ma'am. I heard um, it's a, like, a, like an agonal breathing. I've always heard it being called a death rattle. Seeing that, did you attempt any CPR or anything like that on the deceased male? I did not, no, ma'am. Okay. Why not? Uh, well, when I got there, uh, I did not know any of the people or any of the facts or circumstances to what had happened. Only thing I knew that I observed was a body laying in the middle of the roadway that had just bled out and it was by apparent gunfire. Uh, so being that I was the only officer on the scene, uh, without having any other police units to watch my back, you know, there was no way that I could switch my attention to anything medical and still be able to watch my surroundings and watch after my own safety. 
Paul, Ahmad's mom was in the courtroom. She had a, a reaction to his testimony. Uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But an officer has a duty to render first aid at the earliest and safest opportunity to an injured person at a scene controlled by law enforcement. Why do you think the prosecution went into the reasons why this officer failed to render aid to Ahmad? I, I think it's important because that's the natural reaction. You have to remember that even though you're trying to prove the elements as a prosecutor, you have to remember that you don't want your jury distracted by the narrative to put themselves in the place as the evidence and testimony unfolds to ask these questions. And so you have to ask questions on their behalf of the things that everyone is wondering. People want to know, like, why didn't you help him? Why wasn't, did, couldn't you try to save him? Why didn't that happen? And so you have to get an explanation like this as you just recited it, what the rule was, because a jury and a lay audience isn't going to understand it. And thinking about that and going down that rabbit hole takes you away from focusing on the conduct of the defendants in your case. That's why you ask these questions, even though they may seem obvious to folks that understand law enforcement and or public safety responses in a state of emergency, what do the actors do? What are they supposed to do? What the expectations are? That's, that's why they ask questions like this. Well, Ahmad's mother, Miss Wanda Cooper Jones, was sitting in the back row of the courtroom and was heard reacting to Minshew's testimony about not providing CPR to her son, saying quietly, quote, he didn't even go over to help. She spoke to re reporters about it outside the courtroom. Let's take a listen to that. I didn't really understand why he didn't render aid. I understood he had to go and secure the crime scene, but at the same time, he, he had a guy laying in the middle of the road in a pool of blood. I couldn't really understand why he didn't render aid at that time. Very disturbing. Um, he arrived on the scene and he saw a man in the middle of the road, and he also saw people, two other guys that were standing there. Very, I hadn't really put it all together on what he was thinking. It really don't make a lot of sense at this time. Molly, uh, this testimony has to be really, really hard for a mother to hear. How do you think her presence in the courtroom and commentary outside of the courtroom could affect the jury? You know, I think, I think it's pretty powerful. And I think her reaction while she's sitting there listening to this for seemingly the first time, as she said, she's now putting it all together. I mean, I think anybody sitting on the jury can't help but to direct their attention to Ahmaud Arbery's family, not just his mother, but his other family members who are in the courtroom and, and his supporters. And I think part of this testimony that has been powerful today and really harrowing, we saw a crime scene, photos, we heard this officer talk about not rendering aid, is that it's continuing to paint a picture of Ahmad as a victim and not an aggressor. And I think we'll see that theme playing out and continuing throughout all of the testimony in this trial as the prosecution makes its case. Well, we know one of the defendants, William Bryan, um, joined the chase when he saw his neighbors following Ahmad in their pickup truck, recording all of it on his cell phone. Here's Minshew ch testifying to what Brian told him about his role in tracking Ahmad. How many times did Mr. Brian say that he either blocked Ahmad or cornered him during this chase? I'm gonna object to the form of the question. Is he asking how many times Mr. Brian used the word or how many separate times what he's describing took place. I get to re-ask the question, Judge. How many, how many times did Mr. Bryan say that he blocked Ahmad during this chase? Uh, how many times he said it is irrelevant. How many times it happened is relevant. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead, Mr. Minch, you can answer the question. Uh, after going back and reviewing um, the uh, transcribed body camera, it appeared to be approximately five times. Okay. So five times he said that he blocked Ahmad. Yes, ma'am. Paul, whether Brian tried to corner Ahmad once or five times and whether he was successful all five times, should it matter, especially to any claims by his defense counsel, that he was just an innocent bystander in all of this? 
It, it actually does matter. And it's one of the things that I wrote down as significant when I was watching and listening to the testimony. The fact that the defendants themselves articulated and said that they blocked him at least five times matters while they were in pursuit. That language matters. Pursuit. The fact that they talked about him being cornered. All of that matters because those are three very important issues to be addressed and to be evaluated when you're looking at the foundation for what can qualify as self-defense. Because if you are blocking someone, they're not able to get away. They're not able to get a retreat, and you're trying to force them to not be able to retreat. If you are pursuing someone, you are chasing them. You are the aggressor. When you corner someone, all of these things undermine the defense that they are going to claim later on, which is that it's self-defense. And that's exactly why the prosecution here, and I'll just make a note, it was really nice to, for me to see a person of color as part of the prosecution team, especially in a case like this where I think race permeates the core of the conversation. But I love that we've laid this foundation because these exact terms are going to come back to haunt this defense team later when they try and assert a self-defense claim against the actual actions of their clients in the case. That's why today's testimony mm -hmm. is so foundational in undermining the defense that's yet to come from the defense team. Molly, last question. Brian's defense attorney chose to reserve making his opening statement um, until after the prosecution presented its case. Was that a smart move to wait to address the jury before such damning testimony came forward without the benefit of having the defense's theory on the case in the back of their minds? Personally, it's not a decision that I would have strategically made as a defense lawyer. And we saw that the McMichael's attorneys, both Travis's um, and, and Gregory's attorneys, took the time in the beginning to lay out their case and kind of give a roadmap to the jury. Um, so I, I do think there might be some issues with uh, Roddy Bryant's attorney coming in and presenting an opening statement after uh, the jurors already have a sense of the state's case. But I think what's interesting is that we've kind of seen throughout a lot of the pretrial litigation that the McMichael's defense team seems to have a more unified approach to this case, whereas Roddy Bryant's attorney has mm -hmm. been kind of um, making his own decisions and acting a bit more independently. All right, we're coming up on a break, but when we get back, Paul, Molly, I'll get your thoughts on another key witness from the state. More Making the Case after this. Welcome back to Making the Case. We're talking day two of the guilt innocence phase in the trial of the three white men accused of murdering Ahmaud Arbery. Still with me, Paul Henderson, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, and Molly Palmer, criminal defense attorney. All right, two more members of the Glenn County Police Department who responded to the scene uh, where Ahmad was shot and killed, were called to the stand, starting with crime scene investigator Sheila Ramos. Here's what she had to say about what she found on Ahmad's body. We already talked about him, Mr. Aubrey, having nothing in his pockets that y'all found. Correct. Okay, so, um, do you know if he had a telephone or a cell phone on him that day? He did not. Okay. Um, what about a wallet or any sort of weapon or anything like that, tools? No. All right, Paul, uh, this report of a, quote, suspicious black male who these three say burglarized a construction site, had nothing on him, no stolen items or a weapon. Does that chip away at the defense's claim of self-defense and lawful arrest or citizen's arrest, that is? Absolutely. It's really important. And that's why they asked those specific questions when they were saying, did he have any tools with him? How is he going to be breaking in? How is he going to carry away anything that he could have presumably stolen in his short pockets that he was taking from the construction site? This really speaks to and undermines the suppositions that the defense counsel has had from the very beginning. One, that Ahmaud Aubrey was engaged in suspicious activity. He was not. Two, that they were conducting a valid citizen's arrest. They were not. And three, that he was connected to crimes in the past that he had been involved with at that location. They can't prove that, did not know that, could not approach that in any way that was valid based on their statements or testimony. And that's why they're asking these very specific questions to show independently to this jury that 
this was not an individual that was there for a robbery, that he could not have stolen anything. He couldn't have taken anything. He was not preparing to try and steal from that house at that location. So, yes, it's very important to me. And you'll see the prosecution come back to those answers to try and connect them to the allegations that the defendants are going to make in the future. Well, Molly, what about the argument that, uh, well, the defense made in their opening statement about sort of this timeline of events that there was this sort of, um, the, there was a, a concern in the community about some burglaries and that this was a person they believed, what, Ahmad, what, was the person they believed was the cause of these uh, uh, burglaries. And, and it didn't matter whether he actually was caught with anything or not. It's what they thought he was doing at the time. Does that actually, um, is that effective and will that work? Well, here's what I think is going to be the issue. Ultimately, when the jurors are instructed, they're going to have to refer to this law that has since been re repealed in Georgia. It's our citizens arrest law. It's from 1863. It's a vestige of the Civil War. And what it says is that in order to effectuate a citizen's arrest, the crime that the person is doing has to be committed in your presence or within your immediate knowledge. And so even though the defense is describing having perhaps reasonably or previously seen Ahmad Arbery, their clients previously saw Ahmad Arbery or so they suspected they saw him, um, the problem is that on that day, the 23rd, when he was shot and killed, there was no offense that was committed immediately in front of them in their presence or within their immediate knowledge. And so that temporal mm -hmm. nexus, if that is not connected, I think the defense may have an issue with using the citizen's arrest law. I believe the only thing that they saw was Ahmad actually running from the direction they say uh, this construction site uh, was located. All right, here's the defense on cross-examination of Sergeant Ramos. So is it fair to say that you did not take any photographs of anything up here? I think on it, later that day, you actually saw him back at headquarters. Who? Travis McMichael. Yes. Yeah, you had a very brief interaction with him there. At and I believe you noticed that he was in a distraught state. Yes. And I think you even asked him, are you okay? And he said no. Yes. Okay. All right, Paul, so the defense is trying to prove that Travis uh, felt bad for shooting and killing Ahmad, but, um, but does that actually mean something for the, for the prosecution's uh, case? Does this mean that they're going to have a harder time proving intentional murder? They should not, because what, just like we were talking about a moment ago, even if you were trying to effectuate a citizen's arrest, you are not allowed to be wrong. And they were wrong. They had violated the foundation and the authority to make a citizen's arrest from the very beginning. The fact that you are articulating that, oh, I'm not okay, you know who else isn't okay? Ahmaud Aubrey, because he's dead. You know why he's dead? Because you killed him. So I don't care how the defendants felt afterwards, not because it doesn't speak to their state of mind while they were engaged in hunting down and killing Ahmad Aubrey on the street. That's what the focus is. The reason the defense is bringing this up is to try and talk about all of these other issues as to why their clients could have been confused, as if that speaks to the elements of why they are guilty of killing Ahmad Aubrey. It's a distraction, it's a red herring, and it has nothing to do with the elements of murder in this case that we should be focused on for Ahmad Aubrey. That's that's my approach to it. It's it's very irritating to me uh, to hear the questioning in this way, but that's what's behind it, and that's what the defense is trying to do. They should not be successful, um, and hopefully the prosecution is going to point this out at a later time to make it clear to the jury so that they're not confused. Molly, uh, Sergeant Ramos um, ID'd images of Ahmad's body uh, lying in the street under a blood-stained uh, sheet, close-ups of his wounds, blood stains on the pavement. Um, several jurors squirmed in their seats as the first few photos were shown, um, close-ups of gaping gunshot wounds to my chest and wrist. You know, I, I have this issue with um, 
this sort of image of of defendant or I'm sorry victims black victims in particular in this sort of way I know that the jury has to see things like this and I know the prosecution has to show it um, but what does it actually do for the jurors and and what like what kind of impact does it actually have on the jurors and should the prosecution try and humanize Ahmad a bit since they are showing such graphic photos of him you know, in terms of humanizing Ahmad, I think that they, they can and they will in this case. I think we're only on day two of testimony and evidence, and we're going to hear more about him as a human being and not just him as somebody deceased in broad daylight. I think that's another issue with these photos in particular. Just the fact that this happened in the middle of the afternoon is particularly shocking. Um, but I think what we have to remember is that jury duty is always very difficult, and particularly in a case like this. These jurors are already experiencing, I imagine, tremendous stress and pressure every time they walk into the courthouse. And then we have to remember to actually sit through jury service in a case like this, a brutal murder trial. It's incredibly difficult. And I think a lot of them may experience PTSD or have other emotional uh, you know, effects from, from, being, from simply doing their civic duty. And I think that that's not spoken about enough when it comes to the importance of jurors, but also what they kind of have to go through to do what they're required to do in a case like this. All right, guys, we're up to a, uh, another break, but we're going to continue our discussion of day three of testimony when we return. Tonight, we're talking about the witnesses called to the stand by the prosecution so far in the murder trial of Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael, and William Bryan. My legal panel of experts still with me, veteran prosecutor Paul Henderson and defense attorney Molly Palmer. All right, the demeanor of Travis McMichael has already been a point of discussion several times since witness testimony began. Um, on Friday, the jury heard from William Duggan, another Glenn County police officer who was off duty when he heard the report over his radio and responded to help. On the stand, Duggan watched along with the jury the graphic body cam footage. In it, uh, Duggan asked McMichael if he's okay, to which Travis McMichael says, no, I'm not okay. I just expletive killed someone. Paul, Travis's response there, again, his attorney wanting to establish what his client's mental state was after the shooting. In his opening, he claimed that Travis didn't want to have this confrontation with Ahmad, that he didn't find joy in killing him. Does this help the defense? I, I don't think that it does. Certainly they will try and use it, but I think it just speaks to a state of mind to try and get an understanding about why the defendants did what they did. And in spite of all of that, the reality of it is from a legal analysis, their understanding of it was wrong. And we've seen people be wrong about this vigilanteism in their approach before, like we saw with Trayvon Martin. And in this case, we already know what was in their state of mind from what they testified as to what they were yelling. And we saw what they were yelling and what they were saying, asking uh, Ahmaud Aubrey what he did, what did he steal. We know that they believed that he was stealing, that he was doing something illegal. But they were wrong, and he had not stolen anything. He was not stealing anything. And that does not justify their actions. That does not justify their behavior. That does not justify their chase and use of lethal force of shooting and killing Ahmaud Aubrey. And at the end of the day, that's what the jury has to focus on, and that's what prosecution's job will be, to keep bringing them back to that singular issue for an outcome and a verdict of guilty in this case. Everything else is a distraction. Everything else is a uh, misunderstanding of what the actual law is and what they are supposed to be doing in that courtroom. But again, that's the prosecution's role to be making that clear to this jury. All right, guys, here's Officer Duggan now under cross-examination by the defense. And you ask Travis if he is okay. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And what you meant by is he okay essentially is because he has blood on him and because he's there at this scene of the shooting, you want to know if he's got a physical problem ongoing at that moment, right? That was the meaning of my question. That was the yes. meaning of your question, but he, he interpreted that in his response to you with kind of an emotional response by saying, no, I just killed someone. That's correct. Okay. And as you and I were talking, and I was asking you to, to 
help me understand how you interpreted his emotional response. I believe what you shared with me is that it was like a driver of a car who had just hit a child and then asking that driver after that accident, are you okay? And the person says, no, I'm not okay. I just killed a child. That's how you kind of likened it to me. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. Okay, Molly, Paul says establishing Travis uh, felt bad after shooting Ahmad won't help, but I, I kind of would, I, I think that it could. I mean, with all of the negative pretrial publicity these defendants received, um, allegations of them being racist and, and that the, this was a lynching, could it not at least make the jurors like them just a little bit more? Well, look, the defense is going to need to do that if they want to have any success in this trial at all. And so I think that any opportunity that they have to humanize their clients, to provide context about the fact that, you know, from, from the defense's perspective, they need to show that this was a reaction to an aggression from Ahmaud Arbery. So it can't seem premeditated. It can't seem planned. Uh, even within the span of the few minutes where they started chasing Ahmad and then the whole thing unfolded, they need to make it seem as though they were not going to kill him, but for the fact that immediately he he was an Ahmad was aggressive and came to them and they had no choice but to defend themselves um, and that their life was in imminent danger. And so the defense wants to make it seem as though this was a reaction that somebody would have if they never intended to kill someone. But is it going to be enough to shift the perspective that I think much of the world has of these men? I, I don't think so. All right, the defense's line of questioning led to an objection from the prosecution. Let's listen to defense attorney Jason Sheffield uh, talk to Duggan about his training. Right? Correct. Don't just assume the worst. Let's begin with or attempt to have a conversation. That is right. Okay. And you might try to empathize with that person to try to see it from their perspective a little bit as a way to potentially keep things from rising up and getting heated. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing that you would certainly be taking stock of is the mental state of the person, right? At this point, I'm going to go ahead and object to relevancy of what Officer Duggan and his training as far as all of these things have to do with his responding to the scene of this homicide. That objection was sustained there. Paul, do you think that when both sides object to certain things that that could kind of tip off a jury to believe that maybe whatever they could have heard might have been hurtful to their respective sides? Well, I, I think it makes them pay attention. And you know, Yadid, as well as I do, is that when lawyers are making objection like this in the heat of the moment, it's when the jurors lean in to figure out what were they missing or what are they objecting to and to try and answer the questions about what's going on and why it's suddenly relevant to one side or another. And just in that playback, what stood out to me, and I thought that that was an appropriate intervention from prosecution to not allow the defense attorney to qualify this officer as an expert into the mental state of mind and the sympathy that the defendant in this case may have been expressing about his shock and misunderstanding about the law and misunderstanding about his behavior that speaks to the heart of the issue as to whether or not he is guilty. And so it was an appropriate objection. I don't think that a lay under the, a lay audience or the jury really understood what the objection was about and what it was for, but I do, and that's why we're having this conversation. And so I'm glad that we have the process like that, but I also know that many times objections like this are a distraction to a jury because they're trying to figure out either what the objection meant or the significance of what is being objected to that was just previously said or what was about to be said, especially in a case like this where the objection is sustained and the questioner and the advocate does not get to continue the line of questioning or have an answer to the question that was just posed in front of the jury.